views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hola everyone and welcome to Open, the one and only show bringing the best of the Bronx, New York and the world straight to you. I'm Rina Valentin, your host to Café con Leche every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we'll learn about Pencils of Promise, a nonprofit organization providing educational opportunities for children across the world. After that, we'll sit down with Latinx award-winning writer Elaine Del Valle to discuss her newest young adult fiction novel, Bronzeville Bread, Dreaming Out Loud. Then we'll speak to entrepreneur Bethany May about her vegan cosmetic line as well as her digital marketing business, D Plus NY Co. We'll even hear about her upcoming 2020 vision pop-up event. Later on in the show, Bobby C will bring us an up-to-date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight features Bronx-born award-winning artist Rachel Cara Perez, who will perform Echoes on our Open Artist stage. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way, because now we are officially open. <laughs> Welcome back to Open. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café con Leche. You know, we're always inviting you to get social with us online, that is. Tweet us and follow us on Instagram at Bronxnet TV or like us on Facebook at Open Bronxnet Television. And of course, while you're there, don't forget, follow moi on Twitter, Instagram, FB, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So Pencils of Promise is a nonprofit organization providing quality education for children across the world by building schools and creating educational programs there. Their goal is to provide a future where all children can succeed. And joining us to tell us more about the organization, we welcome Pencils of Promise CEO, Bronx born and bred, Tanya Ramos. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming back home. Yes, nice and to be back. Passing it forward to our viewers thank because you. your story is quite the inspiration. Thank you, thank you. And I'm looking forward to learning more. So, <clears throat> to date, you have already built over 500 schools. 518 to be exact. To be exact. Over the last almost 12 years now. 12 years. Okay, let's look at that. 12 years, over 500 schools. That's exactly right, serving 100,000 students around the globe in Ghana, in Laos, and in Guatemala. Okay, so why did you choose these particular destinations? Our founder, mm -hmm. Adam Braun, uh, he traveled the world and he identified, I mean, and we know that there are a number of countries that could certainly use support. He identified these three areas as places he wanted to build schools in and help students um, thrive and have access to a quality education. And so how did you become involved and how, what I guess drew you to this mission? Because this is like a serious mission. It's a lovely one, I might add. I, I have to say that um, making sure that kids that look like you and I have access to a quality education is part of my DNA. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a Bronx native. Um, grew up in the city to two hardworking parents who struggled to make ends meet. And education was the lover. Right? It enabled me to pull myself out of poverty. Um, and I see myself in all the kids that we serve. And when I had an opportunity to serve as the first Latina uh, CEO at Prince of the Promise, and I had a chance to travel um, and see the impact that we're making firsthand, I, I knew that this is where I belonged. That's lovely. And congratulations Thank on you. that. And uh, you know, it's something to be a CEO and then uh, for an organization, and then, and then there's that other aspect of living purposefully, right? Correct. And you're kind of combining the two. Yeah. 
And that, I, I can only imagine, must be so fulfilling to you. It's so <laughs> rewarding, and I oftentimes tell people I feel blessed. Um, I don't know that I even dreamt the life that I lead today, and um, education is a part of that. Having great mentors along the way that really saw my promise um, and invested in me makes a world of difference. And I was just sharing recently, I had, um, I remember our trip to Ghana and speaking with students and speaking with parents. I'm a fellow parent, mother of two kids under 10. And it doesn't matter where you stand in the world, you just want your kids to have it, a, a better opportunity than you yourself have had. And I've really worked hard to get there and I'm just so thankful that I can make an impact every day. That's lovely. And so <clears throat> what are some of the ways that you're able to monitor the development that uh, the uh, Pencils of Promise is having on these schools? Sure. Um, I'm happy to say that our organization is very data driven. So I often will say we tell stories with numbers. We make sure that we have um, programming that we are able to test on metrics. Um, we have a teacher support program and we're able to really um, monitor their success with their students. We have EGRA testing, which is early grade assessment testing, so that we're able to ensure that our kids are leaving our schools um, literate, which is really the game changer. Uh, for many of the kids that we serve, their parents haven't gone to school. They themselves are illiterate. Um, so for us, that lever that I mentioned that really pulls you out of poverty and changes your entire life trajectory is being able to read and write because there's 250 million kids around the world that are unable to read and write. And I wanna see that change in my lifetime. That's lovely. And, and, and it's lovely that you've taken that on as, as your contribution to existence, right? Agreed. Uh, it, within humanity. And so, um, that which leads me to the individuals within the communities, right? Okay. Because I understand that you also hire, hire locally, Absolutely. right? So even though you're monitoring Absolutely. Um, through the electronics, right? And th through technology, you're hiring locally. So you're elevating the community as a whole, not just the children, of course, they are the most important because they are the next generation of course. and that's what you're trying to transform however so how do you go about doing that I mean 500 schools over 500 you said 513 18 18 so sorry no, no worry that five Don't cut like up my 518 five. that's right <laughs> 518 that's a lot to monitor so um just g t walk us through the the layers of, of how this whole process occurs i mean i will tell you that i think um this really speaks to our sustainability model um i think there are various nonprofits and organizations and even individuals with the best intentions but the reason that we have had this level of success, the fact that we have 500 plus schools around the globe over more than a decade has been because we, um, we partner extensively with the Ministry of Education in all of the countries that we operate. And that's our secret sauce. Then we ensure- it ain't secret anymore. Oh. <laughs> um, then we ensure that we get buy-in. Um, we never want to build in an area where they don't want us, right? So it is important that the community is bought in. So we meet with local community leaders. Um, the Ministry of Education is supporting us. And then to your point, we hire from within the countries that we operate. And that makes all the difference. I know it meant so much growing up when I had teachers that looked like me and could support my growth and unlock my potential. And that's what we do when we hire from within. Well, it makes all the difference. Well, there's also the cultural significance. Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Right, absolutely. because they're, they're going to be re they're going to be able to relate to somebody who speaks their language, of not course. just in the language form right Agreed. just in, in their way of being and so um what are before we go i want you to just pick randomly which is the uh, greatest success story that stands out for you in since you've been the ceo of pencils of promise god there's so many um but one that i will share which just i find really inspiring pop as we like to call ourselves is really developed by empowering young folks to donate us something as small as $25 to get us started. And we recently had a young gentleman from Omaha um, University, Omaha Pop, one of our pop builds, um, one of our pop clubs. And he was raising money to build his first school in, um, in Laos. And he went on American Ninja Warrior. And he had a number of his um, friends and peers rooting him on, and it just was a reminder that any one of us can find ways to be philanthropic, and it makes an impact across the world. So I encourage all of your listeners to go onto our website, think about how they want to build their own legacy and how they want to make an impact around the world, and I think Pencil of Promise is a great opportunity to do just that.
Wow, thank you. Thank you. Tanya. Such a pleasure. Likewise, thank you for bringing it home and thank you for it just basically inspiring us all to just be part of the change, right? We and all are agents of change. We are agents of change yeah. and we are certainly one. And thank you for bringing it here to our viewers and you guys, once again, she's this is where she's from. These are her origins. That's right. And she's out there transforming the next generation of the world. And uh, if you want to be a part of that change, you can uh, donate uh, by, uh, well, you, you can help donate and change the life of a child by giving them an educational opportunity, which is what we're referring to. And uh, you can visit pencilsofpromise.org. I don't know if you were listening, but there's also the possibility of you being part of your own school development. And um, I think that's quite inspirational. So make sure you visit pencilsofpromise.org. So this past Tuesday, a uh, 6.5 earthquake hit the island of Puerto Rico after a 5.8 the day before. And to date, the island continues to quake, leaving many people frightened and two thirds of the island without electricity. After being on the road of recovery, right, from Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico, well, they need our help again. And so El Maestro Inc. is holding a collection on January 11th from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sunday, January 12th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. And they are located at 1300 Southern Boulevard and items that they're gonna be collecting are anything from first aid kits, uh, camping gear, emergency backpacks, canned foods, toiletries, water, and more. And if you're unable to bring a donation, you're more than welcome. And we encourage you to make a tax deductible donation via PayPal. Um, you can go to paypal.me slash El Maestro BX. They are a non-for-profit organization who had a huge impact in contributing on behalf of uh, Hurricane Maria Reliefs. And um, if you need any additional information, feel free to contact Professor Ponce Laspina at, um, this is his email, tu consentido at AOL.com. I wish I could translate that, but um, if you need to, uh, need to repeat it again, it's called tu consentido at AOL.com. There's also another humanitarian relief effort for Puerto Rico taking place January 18th, and that one is happening from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Southern Boulevard and Alda Street. And for the one that's up on the screen right now, you can contact Leila Martinez at 718-792-1140. Uh, okay. Every little, every little bit counts. So please make an effort. Uh, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll hear about a new novel based on the stage play, Bronzeville Bread. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. back to open everyone so our second guest is an award-winning filmmaker producer writer who recently published her first young adult novel 
titled Bronzeville, a Brownsville Bread, a Dreaming Out Loud. Uh, it's a story based on her autobiographical stage play, Brownsville Bread, that tells the story of one girl's journey growing up in the toughest projects in Brownsville, Brooklyn, in the 80s. And joining us to tell us more, we welcome author and filmmaker Elaine Del Valle. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here. It's great to have you again, Elaine. You are doing such amazing work. I mean, you should feel very, very proud of yourself, but as a, a Latina, or as, you know, the new political term is as a Latinx woman. <laughs> <laughs> Latinx. Finally, when women are getting a chance to be acknowledged, they take away our A and give us an X. But that's okay. <laughs> I'm well, working you, with it. Well, you know, I'm working with it, too, because I'm all about, you know, non-gender conform. Com um, sure. Conforming and 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 to be honest, I'm all about equal opportunity in all aspects of our existence. So, but all that to say that um, aside from doing the work that you're doing for yourself, you've been doing a lot for our community, and it it does not go unnoticed. And well, I just want to acknowledge you on air for you so for much. making sure that as you're opening that door, you are welcoming people to walk through it as well. So that's a big deal. I know what it's like to be the person on the receiving end of that door opening. So when people work hard for it, I make it my business to bring them along and help them up the way that I was helped up. So boy, I always say like blaze a path, let other people see the fire. That's what's up. So they can follow, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, that leads me to this book, right? Because I know it's already been presented as a screen, I'm, I'm sorry, as a stage play. It's gonna be a screen yes. play. I, I already, <laughs> bring, bring, bring. As a stage play, um, you've uh, won an Ola Award for the uh, writing of this the stage right. play. And now you've um, transformed it into, or converted it, or I guess taken that style and made it into a book for young adults, which I think is very interesting, right? Because that's the next generation. And I love, I always pay attention to uh, the intentions behind people's projects and uh, feeding the next generation, I think is so important and coming from that place of authenticity, which is what this book is about. Thank you. Well, the stage play Brownsville Bread was so successful. You know, the New York Times wrote about it from girlhood trials to onstage triumph. I mean, how much more exciting is, is, can that be for a writer? And, um, and when I was doing the play, I was approached by a publisher then who said, oh, I want to make this into a young adult fiction novel. And I worked on it for a while, but in the end, that year, a very famous Puerto Rican female <laughs> had um, put out a book, I guess, by a ghostwriter that was collecting dust on the shelves, and they decided that Latinos don't read. Ouch. And that these, you know, the, this audience is not worthy of their market attention. Hmm. And so um, finally, this is me publishing this book. And I actually feel a lot prouder than I thought I would. Because I had done all the work for so long. And then another publisher reached out to me and said, I want to do this. I said, let me reread it. Let me look. Because my career is now mostly making films. And my deepest desire is to make Brownsville Bread into my directorial debut in a feature film. Right. Because, you know, I've right. been directing I know, quite a bit. Right. Yeah, that's yes, what you're doing yes. right now. And that's so it. <laughs> um, I've been very fortunate to be a part of the Sundance family and a part of their labs, their director's labs and their writer's labs. And I finally have the screenplay to a place where I feel like this is really bubbling up. I mean, and you've been reading, you've been writing the screenplay version for a good three years now. Well, uh, more than that. More than that. More well, than that. I remember yes. we we had you here in the studio, and while the other guests were on, you were actually writing on your laptop. Because well, I'm always writing something, <laughs> <laughs> but more more than that. But really, as I learned, th thankfully, like I just said, being a part of the Sundance Labs and and having the benefit of the knowledge of so many very successful writers, directors, producers, and, and really learning the, um, the, the, everything that it takes to make, to make a great screenplay. Because the play stands on its own. The book needed something else. And the, the screenplay will be very different from even what you read in the book, but the emotional truth will still exist in it. And it's written, every, every single aspect of, of Brownsville Bread in every form is told through the eyes of a young Latina. 
So it's a girl coming of age, and we see her when she's eight, and we see her, we're basically with her throughout her teenage years until she gets out of Brownsville. And so it's one of these triumphant uh, feelings that you get for her and her family as they make it out of this dangerous area and, and all the things happening with the family, her father's uh, heroin addiction and his, eventually he succumbs to AIDS. Sorry to give away that. <laughs> spoiler. Right, <a> spoiler, <laughs> but, uh, spoiler, but, it, it, yes. but it's important, I think, personally, yes. uh, to share those little nuggets that are going to feed the souls of, um, let's say, an urban individual who's looking for salvation. Salvation, more, I don't know about salvation. I think more just to, if I had this book when I was that girl living in Brownsville, mm -hmm. um, it would have helped me to know that there was another girl like me out there with a voice out there like mine. And, you know, the stage play, she's very joyful and effervescent. And, you know, 301 Sutter Avenue, between Rockaway and Mother Gaston, you know, she has this feeling. The book is, is a lot more... It's very poetic in some of the way that I've written some of the chapters and uh, a certain sentence that was in Brownsville Bread, the stage play that made people laugh, I made into an entire chapter to make it just hit home that this is who the girl was, that this is who she wanted to be because um, the girl in the book and, and me, I, I grew up as a minority living, and I hate that word minority, but I'll use it for, for this purpose, a minority living within a minority environment. Right. So here's a Puerto Rican girl living amongst black people. When I, when I write my directorial statement and trying to get into these big director programs, I often say I grew up as a black girl screaming inside of a sh lighter shade of Latina body. Got it. And that is a very different, unique perspective that um, this book and the movie and will share with the world. But everything is, is you know, every form takes on another, another life. And, and the film will be vastly different but the arc will remain the same and the emotional truth will remain the same so you know i know you say i don't know about salvation but when yeah. you when at least I, when i read something <clears throat> that i can relate to this yes there's that sense of relief that i'm not alone but then there's also this relation of understanding that as a human being that there's other uh possibilities and and that's what this book actually serves as a possibility and that's why I chose to use the word salvation that you just said oh, thank you know, salvation <laughs> but yes well the possibility dreaming out loud that's yes. why it's subtitled dreaming out loud because we have to as a community we have to know that this is possible and you know I work as a casting professional as well and I very often get hired when there is an ethnic needed, when there is a Latino needed. And every time that happens, I, I very happily take on the job, prove myself and, and give them great fine talent attached to their programs. But then I, I make a note of writing, just so you know, I cast Caucasians as well. Right. And with, with our pool is so much smaller. That's why they come to me, because right. other people can't fulfill it right. in the same way that I can. Right. However, the, the, the vast amount of Caucasian actors that are out there, it's very different from the amount of Latino actors, and not just because of the population difference, but because We're those people were told... Ah, go ahead, at go ahead. a young age uh -huh, uh -huh. that this is possible and they can do it. And for us, we, I mean, at least speaking for me, I didn't really understand the possibilities that I can be a film director. Now I'm an award-winning film director. I know. I'm a playwright. <laughs> I'm know. an author. I didn't know. If I knew then what I know now, I would have started a lot sooner. So people ask me, what would you tell your younger self? Believe in yourself today. Start that path right now. And, you know, people say to me, I'm doing so many things. But no, everything is like this, a funnel into what I really want to be doing, which is, you know, creating films that express a voice, a female-centric voice. And especially whenever I have the opportunity to reveal a young Latina as someone who can be universally accepted and championed and rooted for, that's that's really my goal. Oh my gosh, you're doing such a great job <laughs> representing <laughs> thank it. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you for putting it in the form of a book. I hope readers enjoy it. And uh, if you are a teaching professional, please read it. Consider putting it in your syllabus so that 
children who are maybe of lower socioeconomic means can hear a voice like theirs in, in a book and, and think about themselves in that way. And, um, and yeah, I'd be happy to come out to schools, do a portion of the show. You know, I used to perform the uh, <laughs> Brownsville Bread the Stage Play at high schools and colleges, and that was a wonderful time for me. So I would do like a portion of the play, talk about the way that the, uh, the way that the, the book chapters resemble like, it, but how I, I adapted it and why. How it all evolved yes, into yes, yes. this book form. It but it's all, it. you know, it's more IP, more intellectual property to where the feature film of Brownsville Bread, <laughs> that will be my feature film directorial <laughs> debut. All right, all right, para que sepa, okay? Yes. She's talking the business aspect <laughs> of it. That's it we're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, once again, you guys, to purchase the Brownsville Bread, Dreaming Out Loud, you gotta make sure you visit her website, and that's Brownsville Bread. Dot com and of course you can follow her on Instagram at Elaine Del Valle Productions. And All right. you can also purchase it on Amazon, Kindle, go to your local library, order it there where it's totally free and anywhere that books are sold. Just go into a bookstore, say you want it, and they will order it for you. All right, there you go. Amazon, you know we're all doing Amazon nowadays. <laughs> all right, once again, uh, Brownsville mm -hmm. Bread, available at any local bookstore as well as online. All right, once again, it's uh, back to, oh, we're back in the Bronx, and it's Savor the Bronx Restaurant Week. And, uh, well, Bronxville President Ruben Diaz Jr., he kicked off the event at uh, Seis Vecinos, and Bronx Net reporter Veronica Guzzi has the story. Let's take a look. We here at Says Vecinos for the ninth annual Savor the Bronx Restaurant Week, and you better believe that there's some tasty dishes on the menu. This is the ninth anniversary of, of, of Savor the Bronx Restaurant Week, and we have a record number of 45 restaurants participating. It's great for them, it's free for the restaurants. Uh, they provide either a pre fee menu or a discount or some kind of a freebie of sorts. And, and people can just come and, and enjoy the, the, the various diverse flavors of, that this borough has to offer. The kickoff was held at Cies Vecinos, which translates to Six Neighbors. The service from the Michelin Guide noted restaurant made everyone feel at home. For us being based out of the Bronx and also just being able to showcase Central American cuisine with our emphasis on Honduran cuisine, uh, a category in the culinary world that just doesn't have that much of a spotlight, um, just makes it maybe a tad overwhelming, but at very much that much more exciting, you know, to be a part of, you know, Savor the Bronx, representing, you know, my hometown, um, and just being able to share those flavors with everyone here. I was the first uh, sushi restaurant, and people thought I was crazy bringing sushi into the Bronx, but it doesn't matter. People all over the world, except me maybe, like sushi a lot, and at Cite, they have the, exper the experience of getting a very fresh, good sushi. This is an excellent opportunity, not just to get exposure within the borough, but throughout New York City in general. Uh, Bronx, Save of the Bronx Week gives us an opportunity to show the area, the community, what it is that we do, what it is that we're about. A lot of times in the restaurant industry, a lot of people have a tendency to go to the same places or places that they know, and this is an opportunity for us to say to the community, we're out here as well. Here's a sample of what it is that we do. Here's a sample of how we tie ourselves into the community. Save of the Bronx is about celebrating our place. Save for the Bronx is about us as a borough letting the world know that not only that we exist, but we are the broken down Bronx and we are just as good and not better than everybody. Our cuisine is second to none when it comes to taste and flavor. Our cuisine is second to none when it comes to diversity. Think about the concept of Save the Single. Think about how this beautiful restaurant helps to bring up this area of the Bronx. And think about even more importantly, how it's being done by David I think the best thing we can say is that our doors are open. I think we want to be a huge participant in everything that's happening around this neighborhood, everything that makes it so special, everything that makes this borough so special. So if you want to drop by, have a beer, talk about it. If you need us to help, you know, let us know. We want to be able to be as much a participant in the incredible, singular, unique stuff happening around here every second of the day. And we're here. Save of the Bronx will be going on from today, January 6th till the 17th. You can find out more information and all the lists of the restaurants on ilovethebronx.com. For BronxNet, I'm Veronica Guiti. 
Yum, yum. Thank you, Veronica. So our next guest is uh, an entrepreneur from uh, the Bronx who has created a handcrafted vegan cosmetic line by Bethany, along with her media event planning and digital marketing business, V Plus N um, NY Co. And uh, well, she also creates pop-up shops for local business owners to showcase their brands and creations. And here to share more along with her upcoming 2020 Vision Networking event, please welcome Bethany May. Hello and Hi. welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm ecstatic. We <laughs> are ecstatic to share your story. Um, it has been, as you've uh, witnessed in sitting in the audience, uh, a, a show of hope and possibilities. Absolutely. And um, your story falls in, in the same realm <laughs> like of, of so. hope and possibility, <laughs> which I, is, is really my absolute um, pleasure to share with you all at the top of the new year. And so... Before we start discussing your products and, and one, what constitutes uh, a product being vegan identified, um, I want to share with our audience um, a little bit of, of your background and, and your story because, um, you know, the fact that you were put into the foster care system and you're an entrepreneur and, and not only are you an entrepreneur for your own work and your own business, you do it for other businesses. <laughs> I think it's something that our, our viewers would, would really gain from. Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely, um, I would say, a test of my perseverance and resilience, and it definitely taught me a lot. And I'm very fortunate because, um, you know, I can't, uh, a few of the girls that I did meet did not get to grow into the age of being a woman. You know, they, uh, sadly, they lost their lives or, you know, ended up going through the wrong track and things like that. So um, I definitely feel like I beat a lot of odds. You know, I didn't really think I had a lot of opportunity at that time, especially I didn't find many very, um, very many resources. And um, meeting like inspirational leaders in that environment was like a dime a dozen. So it was definitely something that I learned from tremendously. Right. So you originally, you're, you're Cuban, right? Yes, I'm Cuban and Puerto, Puerto Rican, Rican descent. And you came from Miami? Well, I lived in the Bronx, in but the Bronx, I went to Miami, Miami when I was a and child. And then you came back. Yeah. You was put in the foster system at the age of 15, yeah. right? And then from there, you uh, basically, you're saying, um, you were able to persevere and yeah. uh, through your resiliency and just having to, I guess, make right choices. Yeah. I made a few bad ones, too. Well, you know, we all learned <laughs> But from I learned them. from them. Yeah, right? definitely. Right, right. And, and so being in a certain environment, you we can say you're blessed to find the, the people to put you on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely searched really hard for it, too. And it took a lot of um, learning about myself as well, like learning how I can make better choices, learning how to heal, learning who to ask for help and who not to ask for help, like learning what um, resources people do have, whether that's, um, entrepreneurial or like emotional and psychological things like that, you know, because so, we all need it. Right. And uh, from an entrepreneurial state, right, let's talk about the vegan products and what uh, I guess constitute uh, being a vegan product. I mean, I see we've got oils, we've got yeah. lotions. So let's talk a little bit about what we what we're showing here. OK, so um, I make all tons of stuff. I really started with the soaps at first. The soaps were my first thing. And um, I used to put like healing crystals in them and things like that because I'm, I'm a very spiritual person mm -hmm. and I like to um, prompt people to wellness in whatever fashion they feel works for them. So um, I started with the soaps, and then um, I've always been into oils and stuff. I used to be a makeup artist, and I didn't really like the pressure. You started of with that. the soaps, right? Yeah, and I started so, with the soaps. Right, and so you're molding these soaps yourself. Yeah, I mold the soaps myself. Um, it takes a lot of work, especially like the little flowers and stuff, the little details. Um, it depends for each kind of different soap I want to make, but I'm gonna make all different shapes and sizes. So yeah, I mold them myself. I blend them myself. Um, they contain oils as well. Um, so being that they're all organic and all vegan means that there's no animal byproducts at all, not even beeswax or anything like that. Save the bees. That's really important to yes, me. Yes, it is very important. <laughs> it's really important. Thank, they're thank really important. Thank you for saying so. I'm like, yes, yes sister, they're really save, important. The, save bees. the bees. No. Because the bees are like very important. Yeah, they're very important to our, um, to our system. So definitely everything here is all organic, all vegan. And also it's really important to me being a Latina as well because these are indigenous things right you know so um i know we often associate it with um like whole foods and capitalism and things like that right. but through oppression these were things that were taken from us right. and made 
into capitalism. So um, these are things that are very important to me because it's also a means of getting back to our roots as well and what's natural to us. Beautiful. It's beautifully said, and you're absolutely right. And uh, on top of that, just to add on to it, 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 it's all coming from Mother Earth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And what's better than that? You right. know, we have all these resources made readily available to us. So um, I, what I also like about this, too, is I know I, I think this is a great way to prompt people to wellness overall, overall in their lifestyle, because um, appearance is really important to us. You know, we all love to look beautiful. Right. We all love to look youthful. So then I noticed with all of my clients that usually this prompts them to other things like because, for example, the the um, Earth Angel Alkaline Serum that has spirulina and chlorella in Earth it. Which Angel Alkaline This one right here. Okay. So that one's great for your hair and your skin, but it has spirulina and chlorella in it. Cor Chlorella in it, which you can also put into your food, into your smoothies, into things like that. It's an organic. So it's food. edible. Well, no, not, not this. everything, right? But the <laughs> oil. But yeah. if you have right. the, if you have the powder separate, mm -hmm. you can put that into your food as well and into your smoothies, and it, it um, contains like 15 vitam vitamins and minerals. So there's different ways that you can end up introducing natural products into your lifestyle, not just with your skin, but with your food and with your just like health dynamic overall. So before we go, I know you're having a pop-up uh, yes. event, and I want to make sure that they know about it before yes. we end the segment. So yeah, absolutely. And I love the title, 2020 Vision. Yeah, that's right. It's we have year to, of clarity. That's right. We have to come in clear. So um, tonight is 2020 Vision at Havana Tacos, and um, that's a pop-up shop that I put together. I usually put them together monthly. It's going to have um, five other local vendors as well and small business owners. I like to provide them with marketing materials um, such as graphic content for their social media, logos, business cards, websites, all of that. And then so we're going to be there tonight at Havana Tacos on um, Nagel Avenue in Washington Heights from um, 6 to 11. And then I also have an event next Wednesday at um, 10th Avenue, which is a new upcoming spot. It's beautiful. And we're going to be doing more of a networking type of event there with guest speakers um, speaking on how to maintain a business and maintain your wellness and self-care and mental health as well. That's lovely. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for bringing it here to our viewers. Thank I love you. the I love the concept of wellness uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah, right. Because it's important. It's like a small business entrepreneurship while uh, exercising our wellness. Yeah, it's important in, in its entirety. It can take a toll on your yeah, lifestyle. So. Absolutely. Especially here. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So once again, you guys, 2020 Vision Pop event. That's taking place tonight at Havana Tacos, which is located at two, uh, 212 uh, Nagel Avenue in Washington Heights. And that's taking place from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And for more on Bethany and her products, you can visit MissBethanyMay.com. All right. Stay tuned because Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next. And we are Jerome Avenue, the heart of the Bronx. This is where I grew up. Business is booming, people are moving, everyone works hard. Nothing was handed to anyone here. I've been in here to take my passport pictures. I bought flowers here for my mother. Oh, this is where I get my smoothies, by the way. Continuation. This is what we call the O, 170th Street. It feels so Bronx. Hey, my man Fonzie. We've walked up and down the corridor. Nothing but love. And I'm glad to say that Jerome is home. Look at sports this Friday morning on the NBA Hardwood where the Brooklyn Nets remain in a true funk. The Nets losing streak reached seven games on Tuesday as Brooklyn let another fourth quarter lead slip away and fell in overtime to the OKC Thunder. Final score 111-103. This time veteran Chris Paul proved to be the Nets kryptonite as he scored 20 of his 28 points in the fourth and overtime to power Oklahoma City to the win. The Nets are now 16 and 20 for the season, 12 and 13 without Kyrie Irving and two and a half games ahead of Charlotte for the number eight seed in the Eastern Conference. The team has essentially been in every game they've lost during this skid, but they have been, you know, blowing big leads in the fourth quarter that have really cost them game after game. Going into Tuesday's matchup, the Nets have been outscored 123-81 in the fourth quarter over the last four games. To boot, they haven't won a game since our BronxNet cameras took in the Kyrie Invitational at the Barclays on December 23rd. Not sure if that means anything. 
The Nike Kyrie event was highly successful in year two and featured some of the top high school players in the country, including Jonathan Kaminga. Here's more. very cool to be part of that. I'm pretty sure David Fisdale doesn't think it's cool how the, you know, the New York Knicks treated him, but publicly one month after he was fired as head coach of the Orange and Blue, Fisdale said, quote unquote, that he has no ill feelings toward the organization. As for the team, the West Coast swing hasn't been kind, despite a much improved effort under interim head coach Mike Miller. Emmanuel Moutier scored a season high 20 points against his former team, helping power the Utah Jazz to a 128-104 win over the shorthanded Knicks on Wednesday night. The Knicks will welcome New Orleans tonight to the Garden. Still no Zion Williamson as he recovers from injury. The Nets will host Miami tonight. And as a side note here, he may be coping with a nagging shoulder injury, but Kyrie Irving still remains popular among NBA fans. Despite missing the last 25 games, Irving currently is in second place in the 2020 NBA All-Star Game fan voting among Eastern Conference guards. Brooklyn Nets star apparently not only plans on returning to game action within the next week, but also seems eager to show off once he's back at full strength. In the WNBA, the New York Liberty are now at full strength with a new head coach in place. Walt Hopkins officially was named the New York Liberty's new head coach on Wednesday. So all 12 WNBA franchises' top roles are now filled. Hopkins enters a situation quite different than his Liberty predecessor, former WNBA player Katie Smith. During her two seasons coaching the Liberty, they played in the small and somewhat remote Westchester County Center in White Plains. It was announced in October that the Liberty will play at Barclays Center in Brooklyn starting in the 2020 season. A huge step for the team. How about a step back in college basketball? That's the story for St. John's. Georgetown easily beat St. John's 87-66 on Wednesday night. In other local action, Fordham men's hoops will take on St. Bonaventure Saturday tomorrow. That game tips at 2 p.m. From hoops to the gridiron. Divisional round of the playoffs on tap this weekend. Saturday, we'll see number six, Minnesota, at number one, San Francisco at 4.35 p.m. Eastern. That will be followed by number six, Tennessee, and number one, Baltimore. That game at 8.15 at night. Sunday, number four, Houston travels to number two, Kansas City, for the 3.05 start. The final matchup of the weekend has number five, Seattle, at number two, Green Bay, 6.40 kickoff on Sunday there. A spot in the championship games is on the line. Back here in New York, the New York football Giants have announced their new head coach after missing out on Matt Rule and Mike McCarthy. Joe Judge was a surprise hire, even to those making the hiring. If you asked me a week ago, 10 days ago, I would have said it probably would have been a long shot. Co-owner John Mara said at Thursday's presser announcing the former New England assistant. Judge definitely talked a great game in the press conference. He made it real clear saying, quote unquote, that he has an old school mentality, expects his team to be fundamentally and situationally sound, will punch you in the nose, won't beat themselves. Only culture we're going to have in the building is winning, he said. Judge is expected to speak with former Cleveland Browns head coach Freddie Kitchens about a spot on his offensive staff. The two work together at Mississippi State. On the NHL ice, the latest installment of the rivalry between the New York Rangers and the New Jersey Devils went to the Broadway Blue Shirts on Thursday night at MSG. Tony D'Angelo recorded his first career hat trick and added two assists as the Rangers beat the Devils 6-3. The Devils will now skate in Washington Saturday at 7. The Rangers will travel to St. Louis tomorrow for an 8 p.m. puck drop. The Islanders are also back in action Saturday when they welcome the Boston Bruins at 7. Time for some quick hitters from around the world of sports. On the links, one win away from the PGA Tour's all-time record. Tiger Woods will make his 2020 debut at Torrey Pines. Woods announced on social media Thursday that he'll play in two weeks at the Farmers Insurance Open. The move was expected. Woods is an eight-time winner at Torrey Pines, including the 2008 U.S. Open. In other NBA news, Russell Westbrook returned to Oklahoma City Thursday night and was welcomed like a conquering hero. 
Westbrook was the guy who stayed in OKC. He came with the team from Seattle, was a critical part of the run to the NBA Finals. Then when Kevin Durant bolted, it was Westbrook who re-signed and then went on an historic triple-double run to an MVP trophy. He only left when Paul George forced his way to the coast, and it was time for a rebuild in OKC. Nice tribute, nice moment for him last night. And women's college basketball, congrats go out to Baylor this morning. Tia Cooper scored 27 points at number six. Baylor used a dominant fourth quarter to beat top-ranked UConn 74-58 on Thursday night, ending the Huskies' 98-game home winning streak. UConn fell one victory short of tying its own NCAA record of 99 in a row at home. The Huskies' previous loss at home came in the Big East final against Notre Dame on March 12th. 2013. Wow. As New Orleans gets ready to host the college football national championship game on Monday night, fans can also get the full experience this weekend in New Orleans. Of course they can, Rena. Crews are setting up for count uh, for concerts, excuse me, and events throughout the city of Party City. It is the transformation in downtown New Orleans is underway, including LSU gift shops and other businesses near the Superdome. By the way, I'll take Heisman winner Joe Burrow and the Tigers over powerhouse Clemson in the finale. Michael Andretti has been working diligently to bring Fernando Alonso back to the Indianapolis 500, and it sounds like a deal is eminent. The two-time world champion Alonso has twice attempted to win the famous oval race with McLaren. In 2017, the British team linked up with Andretti Autosport and Honda in a joint bid before McLaren Chevrolet venture failed to qualify for the 2019 edition. McLaren is entering its own team into the IndyCar championship this season, but Alonso is not part of its line up meaning a deal to work with Andretti appears the most likely option. I would take him again if he's in it in the Indy 500. And in baseball, the New York Yankees and veteran Chris Iannetta have agreed to a minor league deal. Iannetta, who turns 37 in April, played 14 seasons with five teams, including the Colorado Rockies seen there and the L.A. Angels. Along with catcher Eric Kratz, he'll provide veteran depth competition for Kyle Higashioka as a backup to Gary Sanchez here in the Bronx. Those are the headlines. We have to see this for some perspective on Conor McGregor as he gears up for UFC 246. As McGregor prepares to return to the octagon against Donald Cowboy Cerrone at UFC 246, he is seeking his first win in more than three years. Kind of hard to believe that, but Conor didn't fight all that much and was no match for Habib, of course. To put it into perspective, the last time he raised his arms in victory, Donald Trump was just four days removed from winning the U.S. presidential election and had yet to be inaugurated into office. In the time since, the world has changed in just about every way. The business of sports has also changed along with our definition of stardom. Although he still carries this cachet and is bound to capture the attention of the sports world when he arrives in the cage, all of that is in danger of evaporating with a loss next weekend. We live in a world of immediacy and results. With his long MMA absences, McGregor has provided neither. His recent past is littered with a series of troubling events. He's had numerous outside the cage issues, including multiple arrests and two concurrent ongoing sexual assault investigations against him. This one, he has to win, of course, in the cage. On just about every sports book, McGregor is a three to one favorite to beat Cowboy Cerrone. Cowboy is now nearly 37 years old, has won just four of his last 10 fights, and has been stopped in each of his previous two bouts. If anything, the pairing seems like a setup for McGregor, the kind of matchmaking designed to put him in the most winnable fight the promotion could make against a well-known star. McGregor has no room for error, though, even though most will acknowledge Cerrone will likely have a sizable advantage if he drags the fight to the ground. He's not only a jiu-jitsu black belt, but actually has more of his 36 career wins by submission, 17, than by knockout, 10. I think Cowboy somehow gets it done here and pulls off the upset. Excited for next weekend's showdown in Nevada. Share your perspective with me at The Voice Bobby C. on social. That's your sports. I'm Bobby C. Stay tuned. Praise the Lord. I'm Evangelist Barbara Mayo. I have a program called The Great God. I come on every Saturday at 3.30, Channel 70 and 36 on files. You need to catch me because it's a, current, a, a program to encourage, to lift up, and if you don't know anybody that uh, 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 haven't heard about the program, tell them about it. They'll be encouraged, for God is good. God bless you.
back to Open, everyone. It's now time for this week's Open Artist Spotlight. Our Open Artist Spotlight shines on Bronx-born singer, actor, poet, educator, and all-around talent who's all about building the community through the arts. Her work spans from multiple genres, contexts, and locales. She's performed as, as a featured vocalist in concerts such as uh, the Apollo Theater, Jazz at Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And that's just to name a few. I'm here now to perform Echoes. Please welcome Grammy-nominated artist Rachel Cara Perez. I was a brave soul. I thought I was a brave, brave soul. I thought I was a brave soul. Unforgiving, unapologetic, and yet I am glad you have torn a corner of my heart. I knew you would be special. Indelibly marked a corner just here. Ooh. But you could never hear the echoes, ghost cries of a yesterday you never sung about. I, a call and response unto myself digging my way out of bottomless fears and empty desires. Ooh. I thought I was a brave soul, poet to your avalanche, warrior to your reservations, my body an altar to your insecurities. I'm used to sacrifice. But oh, take me from this mountain, precipice of narcissist woe. I have learned the hard way that self-flagellation serves no god and purifies only the whip. Myself. Oh, oh my uh, gosh, that was amazing. Yeah, you're too kind. <laughs> oh my gosh, that touched me Thank you. in such a way <laughs> that, um, you know, there's a lot of chaotic energy that's floating around the universe. And mm -hmm. so that was just an amazing way for us to close out the show oh, thank today. You. No, thank you for bringing it to us. And um, I, 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 I know I'm still trying to catch myself because <laughs> I'm a little, I, I was like, oh, it's over, it's over. <laughs> I got no. I, I got sucked in, and, yeah. and and you know, there's something healing in in the the words that you've chosen to share, and, mm. and um, you know, just in your journey, uh, how how is it that that uh, um, the the fusion of the oh of the opera with the spoken word, like how is that um, therapy for you? Oh, 
therapy. Well, it, that's interesting because I've, I've been writing poetry for myself since I was 10 years old, and it wasn't until I was a young adult that I started sharing that more with uh, you know, on spoken word circuits or just sharing it in a more public space. But I, I did get my master's in opera, and but I also sang with the Afro-Cuban Jazz Orchestra the whole time I was studying opera. So I was raised with these like interesting genres. And for me, it's therapeutic because writing is my self-care. Like I'm, a, I'm an avid journaler, I'm a bookworm, um, and very much it's a stream of consciousness when I'm writing. It's just kind of like, bleh, like all comes out, like very much the way I talk very often. Um, and so it's a way that I can check in with myself. And then this is an excerpt of a solo piece that I'm developing where I'm really challenging myself to bring in all of the different genres and my different disciplines together. And so it's very affirming. It's kind of nerve wracking to, 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 because it's, a, it's vulnerable, right? So it's a different type of vulnerability to, to sing my own words, to sing my own music, um, and, and instead of having it written by a composer or a librettist and it's set out. Like, it's not, I'm not playing a character, I'm being myself. Right. So it's, it's, it's affirming, it's grounding, and it's very validating because I have to be brave in a different way right. than when I'm playing a character. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. so brave to operate from this place of transparency. Yeah, that beautifully put. I wish I had said that first. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You shared it with us. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, How about you. that? Thank Are you me. performing anywhere? Um, well, recently, right now, I have, I'm going to be a vocalist for a couple of things. Um, more Afro-Cuban music coming up soon. No dates set, but I will be sharing that, as well as being a vocalist for um, a movement piece. And most recently, I did um, some Christmas uh, concerts where I featured Puerto Rican Aguinaldos with the Bronx Arts Ensemble. And that was just like a few weeks ago. That was a string quartet. Very classical in nature, but it was like a really beautiful experience. So, Lovely. yeah, there's more things. And I'll be sharing this work and expanding it. So. On your website and everything, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, oh absolutely. Gosh. Thank yeah. you for sharing it yeah. here with us. Oh my gosh, what an amazing way to close out the show. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, you know I'm a fan. Thank you. And I'm so happy we finally got you on. I know. And you guys, for more Michelle, please be sure to visit her at rachelcaraperez.com. And of course, you can follow her on IG at Rachel. Cara, and Cara is with a, a K, yes, Perez. <laughs> all right, that's our show today, mi gente. Yes. Thanks to all our guests for coming through and to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Rate Cablecast tonight and 24 hours a day at Broxnet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor. Can you just do that opera thing for me? Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amor. Oh, yes. <laughs>